Welcome, read.co.uk. UK. Um, so this is my 2015 recap of the year, the Christmas lecture. Um, so you may remember I did this last year. Uh, I had to remember an awful lot of stuff. This year I've got even more stuff to remember. So I have, I have 75 slides that I need to get through since you're all late. I need to get through in uh, a couple of minutes. So this year we're recording, we're recording what we're doing. We're not only recording it for, um, for YouTube, so this will go up on YouTube later. So everybody, say hi to YouTube. Oh, come on. <laughs> say hello, YouTube. Hello. That's much better. Um, and it's also going live uh, on, uh, uh, what's it called? Periscope. Periscope, that's it. Um, so it's going, going out live on Periscope, which is not the first thing I am going to forget today. Um, so the way that this, this works is from the beginning of the year, I have a bookmarks folder. Um, and all of the interesting stories that I read, I put in my bookmarks folder. So there's a 2015 recap folder. And generally what happens is, for 11 months of the year, I don't put anything in it. And then when you tell me that I need to make a presentation, it starts getting filled up from that point. So a lot of these stories are quite, are quite new. Um, so we're going to recap the year, and then we've got some, a few predictions. Some, some are quite stupid, but largely this is kind of science and technology. So it's supposed to be fairly watchable for you guys. It's not supposed to be too in-depth, but we are covering largely science and technology things. So there's internet in there, there's science, medicine, all of those kinds of things. So last year, um, I just wanted to, to take you back for a year. Actually, it's good that Brett's here. Brett, we'll come back to you in a second. Um, last year, do you remember I told you that I backed something on Kickstarter? There's this drone. I was really proud of myself. So I backed the, uh, the Zano drone on Kickstarter. That went on to become one of Europe's largest Kickstarter projects. Um, it got 2.3 million in funding. And in November, uh, they declared bankruptcy. Um, <laughs> and they're not going to be shipping anything. So Take this as a warning that anything I say, you should completely discount. And if I'm excited about something, it's probably not good. Um, so yeah, I back, I back Zano. Don't, don't listen to a word that I say. Um, last year, Brett, because uh, I, I asked for submissions of the most interesting stories or, or objects that you've seen. Uh, Brett from the audience. Hi, Brett. Um, Brett suggested the most exciting thing he had seen in a year was boxes with windows. Um, <laughs> Not, not integrated windows, not like Microsoft, but actually just, just bits of perspex in the front of it. Um, do, do you think that carried out this year, Brett? Do you think it, it says? It's a huge market in South Korea. Uh, a huge market in, in South Korea. Um, so I thought, I thought we should follow through with Brett's advice for this year. Uh, he has suggested that his website, MetroDesk, is uh, the most exciting thing he's seen. Uh, so obviously, read.kid.uk has launched three startups this year, of which MetroDesk is one. We've also got Startup, Startup, uh, and Read Commercial. So that's exciting. Um, and uh, actually, genuinely exciting as well. So Brett, thank you for that. That was actually a useful tip. So MetroDesk will be the big thing in, in 2016, right? So what, what are we going to talk about today? Well. I'm sure you're absolutely gagging to know whether it's worth you spending an hour listening to me. Uh, we're going to talk about what Twitter has just said. They've released their recap of, of 2015 just the other day. So we're going to take a really, really quick look at what they've said, what's been talked about on Twitter. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mergers and acquisitions and, and venture capital funding. Um, so some of the bigger spends that have gone on out there. Uh, a bit about consumer technology, some shopping, some jobs and economy, health and welfare, something about the environment, something about space, AI and something called the intelligence explosion, uh, robots and automation, the internet of stuff, which some people call the internet of things, uh, cybersecurity, cat science and my predictions for 2016, just so that you can look back next year and tell me how wrong I am. So. And I am going to be moving very, very quickly. I'm, going, I'm literally going to forget everything that, that I've got in this deck. There's set, they are, there are genuinely 75 slides and about five things that I'm supposed to remember on each. If I remember one, I'll be doing well. So I'm going to move pretty quickly. These were the top tweets. Um, it, in fact, the top, the, the most retweeted tweets in the top 10. Um, is Jamie Bodkin in the audience? No, that's a shame. Um, and I'll tell you why it's a shame, because the, of, of the top, in fact, just over the top five, the top half of the most retweeted tweets, uh, the original members of One Direction uh, took over all of the most retweeted tweets. So I know Jamie will be gutted that he wasn't here to hear that startling piece of news. Um, in news, uh, for us, a, a really interesting point that actually jobs was the most used hashtag, um, and then largely dominated by terror attacks in Paris. 
which is not such a positive thing. In technology, um, Periscope gets a mention. So obviously Periscope is a, a live streaming app, which was this week voted the, uh, the iTunes top app of the App Store app of the, uh, the year. Um, and also, quite interestingly, with all of the other tech stuff in here, obviously you've got things like Android and iPhone and iPad, but you've also got a number nine startups. So obviously there's a, there's a really big um, interest in technology in startups as well. So this is very much part of the, the current zeitgeist. So that's what Twitter's saying. That's what largely the population of the world is talking about. So now we're going to look at some of the biggest transactions that, that have happened in the last year. So one thing, and I don't expect you all to be blown off your chairs by this piece of, uh, of information, but it's quite an, an interesting telltale event, is uh, you may have heard of Dell, you've probably heard of Dell, and you may not have heard of EMC. Show of hands in the audience who's, who's heard of EMC? Uh, so about a quarter maybe. EMC, big company, selling big iron, so, so big bits of hardware to large companies typically, so things like storage. They would sell massive arrays of disks to, um, to companies that were buying all their own hardware. So EMC and Dell as well, because Dell has a large server business as well as the laptops, um, they are both quite threatened by things like Amazon AWS and Azure and all of these services that are being consumed in the cloud. So Dell and EMC in a slightly uh, questionable merger have decided to come together. They already had quite a strong relationship, but Dell and EMC have decided that, that they're going to bring themselves together in what is considered the largest technology merger ever. So there have been bigger mergers, I think the largest of which was AOL Time Warner. Um, that was about $100 million more than this, about $180, sorry, $180 billion. This was $67 billion. Um, but most of the ones above this in terms of scale were actually sort of telcos and things like that. So this was an enormous merger but almost, interestingly, almost driven a little bit by fear of what's coming rather than necessarily a really strong alliance between the two companies. So, interesting background, but we will talk about much more interesting stuff than this, like cats, very soon. This is the hardest slide I've got in the whole deck because this is the easiest one for me to completely screw up. So, this year, actually at the end of last year and this year, we've seen some, um, some big mergers in the, the tel telcos in the UK. So the reason it's difficult is because it involves BT, EE, 3 and O2. So it's really important that I get them all in the right order, otherwise who's buying who gets really screwed up. So at the end of last year, BT decided to buy EE, which in October uh, was passed by the competition, uh, competition regu regulatory bodies. So they said, that's OK, BT can buy EE. Uh, and that was a £12 billion deal. More recently, 3 has just announced that they're going to be buying O2 which I think makes the largest telco in the UK. So that's a 10 billion pound deal. So why are they all doing this? Apparently across Europe, there's massive consolidation between all of the telcos. And the reason is that all of the, the revenues that they're making are actually dropping. The margins that they've got are dropping. And what they're trying to do is come up with what is called quad play, which I'm sure you've heard, but it's essentially the bundling of television and internet and home, home phones and mobiles to bring everything together so that they can try and get more out of you as a customer. So they would tell you it's all to do with giving you a better service. In reality, it's so that they can make more profit. Um, what's really interesting Interesting is, although BT and EE were cleared by the competition authorities, three is now being investigated by Brussels. So it was, it was announced this month that three, that this three purchase is being invest, investigated by Brussels um, because there are fears of that that competition regulation. This would take, I think, the number of telcos in the UK down to three, which is quite uh, quite limited. So there's big movement in where you get your your internet from and, and who provides your uh, your handsets. So we're going to talk a little bit about technology unicorns. Uh, and so a unicorn is, is generally a word that's used to describe a startup that is worth over a billion dollars. So these are, this is quite tricky, these are British companies which are US unicorns. So they're American dollar unicorns. They are, they are worth over a billion dollars, not a billion pounds. Um, so we're going to talk about two. Has anybody heard of TransferWise? Nods. So TransferWise, a uh, really interesting company that is essentially kind of peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer foreign exchange. So what it does is it matches up people that want to sell currency with people that want to buy currently, so, currency. So it disintermediates those old foreign exchange kiosks that you used to see. So if I've got dollars and Ben's got pounds and we want to swap, then what this does is it actually brokers that, that deal for us. Um, so TransferWise, which in eight years of business has never made a profit, uh, has just raised 58 million pounds in funding and is valued at a billion dollars. So I am switching my... Uh, 
it just makes it easier for me to remember than 660 million pounds. Um, but TransferWise, even though it's never made any profit in eight years of trading, has just, just received another, I think, Series C of, um, of $58 million. Uh, TransferWise is a London company. Moving on to Skyscanner, which is an Edinburgh-based company. Skyscanner is, is probably, you could argue, much more of a success, success story uh, on a trajectory not that dissimilar to ours. Um, back in 2007, Skyscanner had a million pounds in revenue. Um, today, they have... Uh, about 100 million pounds in revenue with about 700 staff. So they're a little bit bigger than read.kid.uk. Um, they have just raised 65 million pounds in funding, valuing them at just over a billion dollars as well. They joined Shazam, which is the other British technology unicorn. So Shazam, based in London, uh, was valued at a billion dollars earlier this year after, uh, after its round of funding. So Skyscanner, um, if, if you haven't, if you, you're not familiar with the site, it's very similar to a lot of other uh, flight brokerage, flight aggregation sites with the one standout feature that you can choose to go everywhere. So when you're, when you're looking at flights, you can choose the date that you want to go and then it will tell you where you can go for the amount of money that you've got. So coming out of the UK, we've got what I've called for the sake of argument, super unicorns. So super unicorns are companies which are valued at significantly more than a billion dollars, um, of which it probably surprises nobody in this room to hear that Airbnb is, is one of them. So Airbnb has raised uh, one and a half billion dollars in funding, now solidly back in, in the US. So one and a half billion dollars in funding, of which about a billion dollars was reputed to come from private investigators, uh, in, in, investors. Um, seriously, if that's the only mistake I make today, then it'll be, it'll be brilliant. Um, and, and that round of funding values the company at $25 billion. Uh, Airbnb experienced 90% year-on-year growth this year. So um, they're still growing. They're still, still uh, you know, complete power in their market and, uh, and absolutely a game changer. Um, coming off the... Um, Actually, just very quickly, back on, uh, back on Airbnb, the only companies that have come close to this, this level of funding, this is not the valuation, but how much funding that, that they've got, um, Facebook got around the same, the same valuation. Uber got just, over th uh, well, just under $3 billion in funding. Sorry, not valuation, $3 billion in funding. Uh, and Alibaba got about the same. So they're really playing up there with some of the biggest rounds of funding that, that we've ever seen in technology. Um, I'm sure you all know about eBay and PayPal um, splitting. You've, prob you've probably all got PayPal accounts, or 90% of people in here have probably got PayPal accounts. Um, and really the news here is that uh, global online tap bazaar uh, eBay and PayPal, the payments provider, are separating. What's really interesting about this, you probably know that eBay bought PayPal, made lots of sense because it made actually going through all those transactions that much safer, but they've decided to separate. The reason given is really that PayPal needs that autonomy to act outside of eBay to counteract the threat that's coming from things like Apple Pay. So there are other payment providers in the market. You, we've seen uh, Google change the way that it does things with its wallet. Amazon's coming back into the, the payment industry. And obviously we've got um, uh, Apple Pay, which is a wallet that's contained within your phone. So the, the idea here is that this gives PayPal more freedom to act on its own away from eBay. But the striking thing is that as a result of that split, PayPal is worth almost double what eBay is. So eBay buys PayPal. PayPal grows to about double the valuation of what eBay on its own is left at. And eBay under significant threat from people like Amazon, potentially Alibaba, but also places like Etsy. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> My beautiful assistant is, is trying to hurry me along. Um, so we're going to talk very, very quickly about fintech, which will excite Alessandro. Um, so I made this joke earlier, and it fell completely fat. Look, fintech is not technology from Finland. Ah, oh, for God's sake. It's Christmas. Okay. Um, so fin fintech is seeing an enormous boon. It's, it's financial technology. It, so uh, entrepreneurs and VCs are really, really interested in how traditional ways of um, providing financial services can be disrupted. And really, that's possible now because of the way that security is changing, the provision of services from the internet. So smaller companies can now start disrupting these enormous banks. Um, it, there, there are lots of, in fact, I think TransferWise is a really good example of this, is where something like Forex, foreign exchange, uh, is being disrupted by a company that's a small startup. So we're seeing this more and more, and there's more cash being injected in the startup market in fintech, which is now becoming its own buzzword in its own right. 
Um, one of the other things around kind of finance and technology is around the blockchain. Somebody posted uh, a quite inflammatory article just a few days ago that was saying that Bitcoin is dead and that the blockchain is what's interesting. What is interesting is that Whilst this may or may not be true, and certainly our Bitcoin evangelists in the audience would tell you that there is no way that Bitcoin is, is going away, blockchain is an underpinning technology of Bitcoin, of part of the Bitcoin protocol. So what the blockchain does is if, for example, I have an apple and I want to give it to somebody else in the audience, you can all see that I've actually passed something physical. With something that's digital, it's easy for me to copy it. So it's, it's not necessarily quite so easy to get a sense that I have actually passed that on, that that tr transaction has really happened. So what the blockchain does is it's a distributed ledger that asks people to guarantee that that transaction really has happened. And when you get six people saying that really has happened, it's considered confirmed. So what's happening is that um, really big companies, companies like Amex and Visa and MasterCard, even the Bank of England, are starting to consider how blockchain can be used to verify that transactions are happening. It's much, much deeper than what Bitcoin does, which is obviously a digital currency. The blockchain actually guarantees that a transaction has happened. So lots of banks and lots of financial institutions, and even wider than that, are considering the blockchain as a, as a really important technology. And this year, it's really weird, but you, you start hearing these, these big austere companies talking about blockchain. One comment that was made is blockchain is just a, a more appropriate word to use for Bitcoin when you're in a board meeting. So there is an element that Bitcoin actually isn't going away, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't diminish the importance of, of the blockchain technology. Um, one thing I will just say, actually, is on all of these slides, you'll notice that there's a, normally a bit.ly link or a, a, a short URL embedded in all the slides. So I'll share this later. So if anybody wants to see proper information, because I'm moving so quickly, if anybody wants to see proper information, I've linked to generally the most in interesting article about this, and you can, you can go to any of those links later. So now we're going to move on to consumer technology. We mentioned Dell earlier. One of, the, uh, one of the interesting things that, that has been announced this year is IDC were predicting a drop. So IDC are an analyst group. They were predicting a drop in the number of PC shipments by about 3%. The drop, the fall in PCs being shipped, is actually greater than they expected. So we've, we've lost about 5% year on year in terms of PC shipments. About 300 million PCs have been shipped this year, or with the, the most recent figures. Um, Within that roughly the same time period, and this, this might be a bit spiky, but within roughly the same time period, in one quarter, over 70 million, over 70 million iPhones were shipped. So if you annualize that, because that's a quarterly figure, if you an annualize it, just iPhones are starting to outstrip the shipment of PCs. And obviously, you've got lots of different things that that could be. You've got Chromeboxes becoming the most popular laptop. You've got tablets and kind of the super tablets, the phablets. Um, so different computing form factors are starting to take over from the, the traditional PC. So very, very soon, you will not see that the PC is the primary means of working. Certainly, it's now not the, the primary means that most people use to do their own, their own computing. So you normally take a phone out, and if you want to do something, answer an email, use a phone. In the workplace, this will become more popular. Back in 2001, Microsoft had 97% of the... Uh, the install base of operating systems in the world. Um, at that point, Apple had about 2%. They've not now got over 15%. So Apple uh, are growing cons considerably, both with Mac OS and iOS devices. Windows 10 shipped this year in the summer, so in late July, Windows 10 started shipping um, to pretty good reception. Um, uh, Windows 8, you may remember when I had this, had this discussion last year, Windows 8 had had a terrible time and was largely hated by everybody that used it. Windows 10 got a pretty good reception, and most people that started using it had a pretty good time. What's really interesting is actually that Windows 10 has had a much slower adoption than Windows 8 ever did. So even though most people think it's better and it's a, it's a significant upgrade, it's not moving as fast as Windows 8. Quite why that is, I couldn't tell you. What is interesting is Microsoft are pushing it incredibly hard. We've probably never seen them push an operating system quite as hard as they pushed it. To the extent that they've actually rolled it out, does anybody have, have an Xbox One at home? No, no one has an Xbox One at home. Well, if you did, has anybody got a PS4 at home? And let's try that again. Has anybody got an Xbox One at home? For the record, no one. Um, if you did have an Xbox One at home, uh, over the wire it's had uh, an upgrade. Its operating system has been upgraded to Windows 10. So now PCs and Xboxes have the same operating system. What we have seen, Microsoft released figures and said that when you look at gamers, 
the, um, the Windows 10 install base is now playing more games, there are more people using Windows 10 to play games than Windows 8 and 8.1 put together. So there is growth, I don't know if that includes the Xbox One users, but there is growth in um, the number of people who are using Windows to game on. So, and that's probably not, not unsurprising because they're generally early adopters. USB-C, right. Um, I have put it's not magic, but actually it is. This is the closest you are going to get to magic in your entire lives. This, this cable will revolutionize your existence. How many people here have any form of iPhone? Have you ever needed an iPhone charging cable? Yes. Have you walked around the office asking for an iPhone charging cable? Right. Um, the amazing thing about USB-C, and the most amazing thing is that Apple are actually using it because they've got this history of lightning, uh, lightning adapters, lightning um, connectors, and firewire. So this is a USB-C USB cable, and it's powering uh, one of the new MacBooks. The reason that that's important is USB is a, a standards body. So it's not just the cable, but USB is actually a standards body. This magical cable can not only power your MacBook or any other device, and we're starting to see, it because Google use it, um, lots of other people will use this. I think we've now got, um, I think the new Chromebook Pixel uses USB-C to charge. The amazing thing about this cable is it doesn't just power things, which it does, it can, it can run 100 watts at 20 amps. Um, so it, it's got more than enough power probably to charge your phone in minutes when the batteries can take it. But it can also run 4K and 5K video over it, and it can be used for data transfer. So in the future, yes, you'll have to throw out all of your old USB cables, but everyone in this room will just be able to use USB-C and you'll be able to charge your devices, which is pretty magical. So even though I say it's not magic, it really is. You never thought I'd get so excited about it. No, you probably thought I'd get that excited about it. It's a, it's a brilliant cable. So talking about shopping, uh, anybody got a Prime account, Amazon Prime account? Um, which, so Amazon is one of the big movers. Last year I was talking about a lot about Google. This year I'm talking a lot, still a lot about Tesla, but a lot about Amazon as well. So Amazon have got a lot of column inches this year. Um, Prime Now was released in the US much earlier this year, maybe even towards the back of last year. It was released in, um, or, or it became available in London this year. It's now available in three UK cities. So it's available in Birmingham and Newcastle. And essentially for, I think it's seven quid, you can get something delivered in an hour and if you're a Prime customer, you can get it delivered for no extra charge in two hours, which is absolutely amazing. It does mean that you have to have a separate app on your mobile device. You can't just go to the, to the site and do it. And, and there is a more limited set of things that you can buy. Uh, I tried to buy a tripod for the camera this morning, but they've only got little tiny ones. So this is not their full distribution warehouses. The fastest that anything has ever been delivered, the record for the UK that anything has been delivered, which was for a USB cable, probably not a USB-C cable, but a USB cable and some electric toothbrush heads was delivered in 14 minutes from a distribution center in Wimbledon to an address in Morden. So somebody ordered something and 14 minutes later uh, it arrived. Uh, even better than that, if you consider that 14 minutes, in New York they've just started shipping booze. So this is really, really important. 14 minutes to get booze delivered to your door. You don't even have to move anymore. It's fantastic. Apple Pay. Um, there are, I know there are a few Apple Watches in the audience. So uh, Apple Pay is something that you can use on both your Apple Watch and, uh, and newer uh, iOS devices. So it works very much like contactless. So you can walk up, you can, you can pay by tapping your phone or your watch on, uh, on a contactless um, reader. So. The reason that it's important, as we've seen, it's, it's already be cons being considered to disrupt payment systems like PayPal. Um, one of the benefits of, uh, of Apple Pay over using your credit card is it it's actually uses tokenization. So instead of passing your card details so that the payee, the, the shop that you're paying, actually can charge you based on your card details, it passes a token over to that, that contactless reader. So it's slightly more secure, which is great. So that's a very good thing. But it's, it, it's the start with, you can start seeing how wearable technology, this kind of thing, is starting to get much more embedded. Moving on to health and welfare, and actually, the, you know, obviously, the fact that we've got a, an Apple Watch up here is something which is a fitness tracker as well. Moving on to health and welfare, a term which has really been around since, since years ago, I think, I've certainly seen articles from about 2011 talking about the quantified self, but quantified self is something that is becoming much more spoken about. It's a, it's really the concept that everything that we do is starting to feed data back about ourselves to proactively m manage, monitor our health. So to make us healthier as individuals. What's really interesting is tens of thousands of years ago, we actually gamified exercise. 
So you may not think about it, but back when we were hunting antelopes, if you ran around a lot and killed lots of cute fluffy things or picked lots and lots of berries by walking really long distance, you were rewarded with lots of food. Now we sit at desks all day and we hardly ever move, which means that we have to do all of this kind of stuff to tell us when we have to get up and do exercise. So we're having to come up with new ways to actually motivate us to, to do the exercise that we need to do. And we're getting more and more data from all kinds of things. There's a, a, an in-ear headphone called Bra the Braggy Dash, uh, which is considered the first hearable technology which helps you exercise and when you're running it tells you the, the, the pace that you're doing but increasingly we're getting heart rates monitored we're even getting blood pressure monitor salinity of our skin measured all those kinds of things so more and more data is being generated by us and the big hope it's quite interesting the big hope is that proactively we will become healthier so the cost of healthcare will reduce which is a really lovely idea that actually it will start telling us if we have a high heart rate, then maybe we should go and see the doctor before it becomes a problem. So if we can proactively manage our own health, then healthcare costs should go down. The flip side to that is we'll all live longer. So actually we'll need to work longer as well because we'll need to pay all those healthcare bills. So it's quite, it's quite a complex thing that, that we're creating here. Um, really interesting study. This was I think this one uh, was from Tel Aviv University that actually studied um, 1,500 brains, so scans of 1,500 brains, where they tried to, to figure out if there was any dimorphism, so any, uh, any physical split. So was there actually a physical difference between men, men's brains and females' brains? And largely they found that, uh, and this is actually pretty common in psychology, they, they found that there is more difference, so there's difference between individuals Oh, no. Um, there's difference between individuals, but, um, but not specifically gender-based. So they found that it runs on a spectrum. There are male traits and female traits. Uh, and actually, it's kind of a matrix of, different, uh, of these different traits that blend together. And there are very few people that are heavily to one side or another of that, that spectrum. So um, even though there, there are physical differences between men and women, it's not in the brain. And we can now, uh, we can now say that with a high degree of certainty. This one is absolutely fascinating. This, this, this is a really, really um, important discovery. You may be surprised to know that it, it, we haven't discovered a new uh, antibiotic in almost 30 years. So if you go to the doctor and he prescribes you an antibiotic, which you probably shouldn't because you should, shouldn't really be using them, but if you're prescribed an antibiotic, then it's been a very, very long time since we came up with a new one. What they've done is they, they've discovered a new antibiotic called... Uh, come back to that. I think it's called ty tyxobactin. Um, and so researchers at Harvard and MIT discovered this, this new, no, it's not Harvard and MIT, but they, they discovered this, this new antibiotic, which wasn't so much impressive that they had discovered it. It was the way that they discovered it, which made it really stand out. For many years, people have said, um, or researchers have believed that there are loads and loads of bacteria that grow in the, the soil creating antibiotics, but we had no way to grow those in a laboratory. So essentially, every time they, they transplanted something into, the, uh, into the, the lab environment, they couldn't actually grow any antibiotics from it. So the reason that, that these bacteria are producing antibiotics is because they have to compete with each other in the soil. So what they did is they actually implanted an electronic chip in the soil to start monitoring the chemical compounds that were being produced by the bacteria in the soil. And from that, they created this, um, this antibiotic, which is, should be available within the next five years and should... Uh, I think it's, it's useful against septicemia and C. diff and tuberculosis. So it's a really, really powerful antibiotic, but the amazing thing is not that they've discovered it and that it's good, but actually that it's opened the door to lots more discoveries because they found a way to harness the bacteria in the soil. So again, nature is doing things significantly better than humans can. This was the Harvard and MIT uh, research, not the last one. So we've actually recently grown um, properly cyborg tissue. So a cybernetic organism. So what we've done uh, in, in a lab environment is grown tissue, which we can actually monitor as it's growing. One of the difficulties that we had before is that if we started to try and pass electrical currents through the tissue that we're growing, through the cells, then we would actually disrupt that tissue. We may even destroy the tissue. What these researchers have done is actually at a nanoscale grow this 3D circuit that they can grow tissue around, and they can actually read signals back from that, that circuit. So nanoscale wires, a 3D nanoscale filament, is, is actually being used to grow tissue. 
which is really, really impressive and talks to us being able to grow many more things, including augmented things in the future. Um, with a long line of, of things that have been grown in laboratories, the, the, the very first um, human vocal cords have been grown at um, a university in w Wisconsin. So one of the interesting things about the vocal cords is they're subject to much higher stress than a lot of the other parts of the body because they have to actually vibrate over a thousand times a second. So because of this really heavy physical demand, they're, they're a quite unique structure. But these university researchers have actually grown these. And again, um, by kind of creating a matrix and then growing uh, tissue around it, actually from, in this case, actually human tissue that they seed into the 3D structure, um, we have grown new organs. This, this joins a list of, I think, hearts and kidneys, which have also been grown by people. And there was also a, bion a, a rat limb grown, or a limb grown on, on a rat previously. Uh, you may recognize where that, that picture comes from. I, we're actually going to run the VT on this one a little bit. Um, what I'll do is I'm just going to check that camera. But we've got, um, this is from um, the Medical University in Venice. Venice? No, not Venice. Vienna. The other V. Um, Medical University in Vienna, where they were treating three men who had brachial plexus injuries. So if you sat near my desk recently, I was getting very excited about the brachial plexus. It's so this part of your armpit here. And what's really interesting is that all of the, the innovation of your arm, so where it comes from your spine, runs through your brachial plexus. So in the case that you have a brachial plexus injury, all of the innovation to your arm stops. And that's what happened to, to these men. They essentially had brachial plexus injuries, which meant that they had very very little movement in their arm and almost none or certainly you'll see the video in a second none in their hand these men took an enormously brave decision to actually have their hands amputated so they removed actually part of themselves even though it was useless an enormously brave decision they they had their hands amputated and replaced with bionic limbs and those bionic limbs were actually activated by the nerves in their upper body so I'm going to show you a video. What you'll see is it's a, very, it's a very quick video that I speeded up, but what you'll see is a little bit confusing until you get the hang of it, is one of the men who is using his own hand, which is the one that does nothing at all. He's trying to carry out certain activities. And then you'll see him using both the hand attached on the outside. So he's got both his and another hand. And then the actual replacement, where he doesn't have his own hand anymore and he just has the, the cyborg limb. So Phil, if you can just play that video. And whilst it seems like a really strange thing to do, you can kind of see when they had their original limbs, they were just completely unable to perform these tasks. With a relatively basic upgrade, they were able to do things like move coins, um, put, uh, move objects around, actually grasp things, pour water in, in, in jugs. And obviously the amazing thing is you can guarantee that that's not going to be the level that they stay at. These will be upgraded and there will be more ability that, that is afforded to them in the future. Can you just click out that for me, Phil? So moving on to the, uh, to the environment, so um, this, this year, we, we actually spoke about, about Tesla last year. This year, Tesla has launched its $3,000 Powerwall house battery. It's available in two formats, a $3,000 one, which is 7 kilowatt hours, uh, and a $3,500 one, which is 10 kilowatt hours. Broadly, those batteries, th this is probably about this size, about the size of me, goes on your garage wall, typically, something like that. And the idea of it is that it becomes a power source in your house that is powered probably by, um, by solar cells. So what, what you do, and what, what's considered to be the most environmentally friendly do, uh, way to do it, is instead at the moment, if you, have, if you have these solar cells, you can harness the power while it's sunny. What this does is it will actually harness that power and store it so that you can use it later. What it will also let you do, if you don't have solar cells or, or a wind turbine, um, you will be able to, to take energy off the grid and store it in your battery as and when you want it. So you can take energy at low peak times, 
and then you can use it. And those batteries are considered about enough for a normal size house for the evening. After, after taking all of the energy for the day, it's broadly considered that that will be powerful enough to run your home for the entire evening without having to go back to the grid, which is an enormous uh, piece of progress for us as a group to, to have this have this availability. I think in the future we'll see a lot more micro-generation with a lot, a lot more people generating power in their own homes and then passing it back to the grid when they have an excess of it. So actually crowdsourcing energy and passing it back into the grid. But to do that, you need a way of storing it. One of the reasons that Elon Musk did this is said the issue with batteries is that they suck. Um, so he's, he's pretty clear. This uses exactly the same battery technology as, as in the Tesla. Um, and is significantly higher than uh, significantly higher capacity and more effective than the traditional batteries of a big size that you would use. So this is really game changing that it turns your house in, or gives your house the ability to store power. On the flip side, and we have a we have a video that, again. This one this one was shared uh, a little bit earlier in, in the year, but this is a video of a place called. We might have to yeah we can we can run this one. Uh, it's quite quite depressing. We might need to turn the sound down on it a little bit. Um, so this is a place in Inner Mongolia in China uh, called Baoto. And um, Baoto is allegedly, or China is, produces something like 90% of the world's rare earth minerals. So you may or may not care about rare, rare earth minerals, but I can guarantee that you're using them. So pretty much every, every smartphone, every wind turbine, probably solar cells, almost anything high tech uses rare earth minerals. Most of them are produced in places like Balto. What you're seeing here is literally just toxic sludge being pumped into what was previously a river. Uh, the BBC reporter, I think, well, I'm not sure if this, this film was by, by the BBC reporter, but the BBC sent a reporter to Balto uh, and described it as hell on earth. Um, if, you, if you Google for it, if you, look at, if you look for pictures of Balto, you'll actually see these steam trains almost tipping streams of liquid lava out of the side on these, these built-up railroads. It's absolutely ghastly what we're doing. It's the, this is a kind of a disgusting thing, but as far as we're concerned, we need it. These things are really important to us. So um, we have these minerals like cerium, which to produce them, you actually have to, uh, you have to dissolve in sulfuric, uh, sulfuric acid which is then what is pumped out here. So this is enormously, enormously devastating for the environment and for actually, as well as this, for the, the people who are involved in its production. So I think we can move on from this one now. It's all right, we'll get to the cat picture soon. So should we destroy the planet? Um, there is always space, which is positive. Um, we haven't screwed up space yet. Now, this is beautiful, isn't it? Isn't that, isn't that a fantastic thing to look at? Um, this, is, this is from a, a British company called Reaction Engines. They've created this, this new type of engine uh, called Sabre. The amazing thing about the Sabre engines is that they work both in atmospheric air, so within the atmosphere, and in space. So they've just, um, they've just had a, uh, an investment from BAE Systems. They've also got funding from the, the UK government. This is a more interesting picture. This is what, this, when they're in place, this is what they'll look like. So um, the, the aim with these engines is that they'll be, they'll be used in hypersonic flight. And if you think back, Concorde, the, one of the most beautiful things ever created by man, was created decades and decades and decades ago. We've not really taken things like air travel forward significantly from them. Uh, the idea here is that we'll actually have hypersonic planes powered by these, these engines, which are a combination of... of um, of rocket engines and jet engines, um, and they will be able to take off in atmospheric air, go into space, and then drop down back into the atmosphere and land, which means, uh, and I have made this gag before, if you don't go into a three-hour holding pattern, um, which means that if you can actually land, that you can get from any point on Earth to anywhere else within four hours which means that Cam can go home to visit his folks in a weekend. Uh, we did get into, into an interesting conversation about how much older you would be uh, by the time you arrived and if you were born in England and took one of these and then died. But broadly, it means that, that planetary tra travel will be much more uh, interesting. So these can, these can uh, move at speed of Mach 5, five times the speed of sound, uh, in the air, and at, at Mach 25 when they're in space. So they're pretty nippy. Um, should we build... 
should we build these nice, fun, hypersonic things? Um, there's also a really exciting story about Mars. Was, um, we've been talking about water on, on Mars for a long time, about evidence of water on Mars, but often they were talking about historical evidence of water. What they've actually said now, with a really high degree of confidence, that water actually exists on Mars right now. And can you see these dark streaks in this picture? So that they consider that these dark streaks are actually briny water. The reason that they think it's briny is because um, they, these move and change shape dependent on the season. So when it's around minus 23 degrees Celsius, when it's around minus 23, that, that's quite warm, these, these start moving around. Um, so what's quite interesting from that is water probably exists on Mars. And if water exists, there's a chance, maybe not a good chance, but a chance that life also exists on Mars as well. So this is a really startling d discovery and, uh, and really exciting for the scientists that are involved in it. This was even more exciting. This, this lit up um, the, the ast astrophysicists, especially the Star Trek geeks among them. Um, so this, this star, I, I knew I wasn't going to remember this one, this, this star KIC 8462852, it's catchy. Um, the, this star in the Cygnus system um, was found to be being blocked. So if you imagine you've got, you've got a star is emitting light, they found that it's being blocked, but at irregular intervals. So if a moon is going around it, you can pretty much guarantee when the moon's going to pass it. So you can, you'll get a pretty good understanding that the moon is blocking it every 12 hours, every 24 hours. There is a time period that exists that's always the same because it's orbiting it. What they found is that something was blocking out up to 20% of the radiation coming off the star at completely irregular intervals. So they, they, they were wondering whether it was comets or, um, or space dust uh, or giant robots. And they actually came, the, one of the theories which gained quite a lot of traction was the concept of a Dyson sphere, which is not anything to do with a vacuum cleaner. I've already been asked, there's nothing to do with a vacuum cleaner. A Dyson sphere is a theoretical construct um, which was a, a, a physicist came up with an idea which he later claimed that he hated. This Dyson sphere is a concept of building uh, a, a massive structure, this mega structure, entirely around the sun with the intention that you capture all of the energy that the sun is producing. So people got really excited because they thought that might actually be what was blocking out the sun. So following this, SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, put all of their, one of their, one of their um, telescope arrays, they focused all of their, their wisdom on this star and they found out that it's probably not a Dyson sphere, which was a blow to all of the Star Trek fans among us. Um, but they still don't know what it is. So they've, they've, they haven't necessarily quite ruled out that it isn't some form of, uh, form of intelligent life. But it's a very long way away. Uh, and even with one of those nice Sabre rockets, it's not going to, they're, they're not going to come visiting us soon. But do keep an eye on this, because we still have no idea what is actually there. There is something unusual and unexplained happening around that star. So AI, it was, it was a relatively quiet year. Last year, I, I spoke quite a lot about things like DeepMind, uh, what Google were doing around AI. It was a relatively quiet year for big news stuff around AI. There have been lots and lots of improvements in AI. So you'll see, uh, we'll talk about Amazon a little bit later. But um, AI's moved on, um, speech under, so, so uh, speech translation has moved on, visual recognition has moved on. Lots of things that require AI techniques have improved. Uh, and this year, there's also, um, in a very specific type of poker, so it was Limit Texas Hold'em, um, somebody developed an algorithm that was actually almost completely infallible at playing. So there, there are these things which are moving on in AI, but this year, the main thing that caught the news was um, particularly Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk have been quite outspoken in talking about what, what they're calling the intelligence explosion, which is the concern that AI will grow so smart that it will become a threat to humanity. That actually, we don't know what will happen. If we keep proceeding at the rate that we are, we're not entirely sure what AI is going to do with us. Um, so at this conference in Puerto Rico, which actually echoed, in 1975, there was a, a conference with molecular biologists attending, where they set out almost rules of engagement when it came to genetically modifying cells. You know, what should we be able to, as humans, what should we be able to do when we're looking at genetic modifications? And what this conference in Puerto Rico, where Elon Musk was talking, um, what they were trying to encourage the AI community to do was essentially provide a, a set of rules of engagement for developing AI. 
what should we allow AI to do? Where are the limits? Where do we stop AI making decisions? Which is really, really interesting. So there are now ethical considerations about the development of AI in the future. From AI to, to robotics is, is quite normal. I spoke last year quite a lot about the, uh, the research. Primarily, the, there was, I think, Oxford Brooks, but also primarily um, American research about how much robots are going to, to affect us. So this was... Um, this particularly came into the news because a guy called uh, Andy Haldane, who was the chief economist for the Bank of England, was talking about this. So he was referring to a report that was written where um, he's really talking about the, the growth of machines, of automation into the workforce and about how it's going to disrupt things. So this is a really, really significant change in the way that, um, that we interact with things and that, that we are required in the workforce. The number of things that computers can do is growing. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of those. Um, this, this graph is not, again, not dissimilar from the one that I used last year, but you can actually see if, if decreasing median pay is here. So if as you move to, the, to your right of the screen, the, uh, the pay decreases, and as we go higher on the chart, the probability of automation increases. That means that if it's a high bar, then it's likely to be automated in the future. You can see that broadly, as pay decreases, you're more likely to be replaced by a robot in the future which is pretty depressing. Uh, at this end, obviously, directors are looking after themselves and buying all the robots. Um, but in here, you've got professional occupations. You've actually got administrative and secretarial occupations here. But this is skilled trades. Even this very high bar here is skilled trades. So we don't really know what's going to happen. And I'll talk a little bit about the things that we can do. But broadly, you are seeing that things will be automated even in white collar roles in the future. And AI is a really, really big driver of that. Um, you're getting a sense of where it's being used. Um, it, at the UCSF Mission Bay Medical Center, um, which is in San Francisco, the world's largest, this should, should be the world's largest medical robot fleet has now been rolled out. So 25 robots are now roaming the halls in this, in this hospital. And what, what might, what's quite interesting is apparently the rate of injury amongst workers is four times higher in hospitals than it is in the private sector. And it's largely because they're dragging really, really heavy things. The type of work that they're doing is injurious to humans. So they're now using robots to do a lot of the, the dull, dangerous, and dirty work that otherwise humans would do. So there's a, a, a big investment, and these autonomous robots, there are some quite cute pictures of these like dressed up. They're obviously on the kids' wards with like masks and stuff on the front. But these robots are starting to do the job, uh, the basic menial jobs that humans would do. Um, these trucks, in absolutely massive trucks in Western Australia, in a place called Pilbara. Um, there, there are now 69 of these trucks roaming two iron ore mines in Western Australia. And they're being run, all of these trucks, they're, they're being run by GPS from um, a station in Perth, which is a thousand kilometers away. So these trucks are roaming uh, roaming the, the iron ore mines, dropping stuff off. And the, the company that run it, Rio Tinto, give the reason that this is obviously much safer for the, for the humans. So th this means that you know, the chance of accident goes down. They then obviously mention at the same time that um, they also don't need to take any breaks and they can run 24 hours a day and they're 20% more effective than the named fleet. So you can kind of see what they're getting at. Yes, they're safer for humans, but also they're much more effective at doing their jobs. And you can have people sat in Perth running them rather than people on the ground. So this kind of robot, robotic automation is really taking over. Um, I'm sure everybody heard about the Tesla over the wire rollout of, um, of version 7 of their, their operating system. So um, Tesla had a really busy year, not only with the Powerwall, they've also uh, launched their SUV, 7C SUV, and they now have uh, semi-autonomous cars. Any of the Model S cars that were rolled out with the right sensors in about the last year and a half um, have now been upgraded over the wire to be semi-autonomous. So they can now drive themselves, which is pretty impressive. Um, the, the issue with this is there's been some criticism of, of Tesla. They were very clear about this. It's a beta rollout. So be very careful with what you do. Keep your hands on the wheel. And there's numerous safety checks that the cars have to make sure that people are being sensible. But they're giving them to humans. And humans are idiots and will do all kinds of stupid things. So there is one video of a guy in Holland who is sitting in the back seat of his Tesla who clearly doesn't have both uh, both hands on the steering wheel. So humans immediately start pushing to see just what they can get away with. And it's quite smart. I mean, broadly, they sit within the, the lines on the highway, and they're pretty good at driving, and they, they can tell how far away they are from the, the car in front. So the, Tesla believes that they will be autonomous before 2020, so they'll be completely self-driving. And they're, they're using the inputs from humans into 
into these robot cars to train the system. So Tesla's been very brave and said, this isn't really re ready, but you test it. And then humans have gone, brilliant, now I can get drunk and my Tesla will drive me home. It's not really how it works. Probably the most impressive thing that they did um, I'm sure you've heard of the Cannonball Run, the, the coast to coast run that you're not really supposed to do in, in the US. There was um, one group of guys with a, there's an ex rally driver who was involved in it who had previously been record holders in the Cannonball, took one of these Model S's and drove across the US in 57 hours, which isn't anywhere, I think the record's in 30 something hours. So they, um, they drove all the way across the US with the, um, the autonomous mode engaged at 90 miles an hour as far as as much as they could get away with it and got across the US in, in 57 hours which is really really interesting obviously the thing is that as soon as there is one of these uh, one of these autonomous cars has an accident all of the development is going to stop and it's good that we've got the legal team here because all of the research and development will stop and suddenly we'll start figuring out what the legal issues with the manufacturer taking responsibility for accidents is even if you are sat in the back of the car with your hands off the wheel and you've had too much to drink um, so, as I mentioned, Tesla, they've been very, very busy. We've got another quick video here, Phil. Um, we'll probably ha have to jump through in a second. So, the, Elon tweeted, <laughs> this is 6.27 in the morning on the 31st of December last year. So, I'm cheating a bit by putting it in here, but it's close enough. New Year's Eve at 6.30 in the morning, he's tweeting about his robot arms. So, um, they, he, he says here, we're actually working on a charger that automatically moves out from the wall and connects like a solid metal snake. Uh, Elon's a bit of a geek, so, so we like him. And in August of this year, he actually put a video up of their prototype. So this is actually the, the prototype, and you can probably, when you play it, you can probably skip forward through to about here. It'll start moving. So this thing, you can just imagine that you drive into your, obviously you have to live in the US because no one in the UK can afford a garage anymore, but, um, but you, you drive into your garage, you, you reverse in, and this thing comes out of the wall and automatically finds its way and plugs itself into your car. Which is absolutely incredible. So we can move on from that now. So, um, so Tesla, Tesla are working on absolutely incredible stuff like that. So the, the Internet of Things. Internet, the Internet of Stuff, this mass of things that are connected to the Internet. I looked at my router at home the other day. I've got about 50 devices connected to my, uh, to my Wi-Fi. There's only two people that live in my house, and there weren't any Chinese hackers on my network. It's all stuff that I own. Um, so there's an enormous amount of things, even in my house, that are connected to the Internet already. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing more and more things, which in the past have been dumb, connected. Last year, Gartner said, um, so if you forget, this, 4.9 billion. They said that in 2020, 25 billion devices will be connected. That was last year. This year, another analyst is saying that by 2020, there's going to be 50 billion devices. So you can guarantee the next year I'm going to, I'm going to be standing here, it's 100 billion devices connected to the internet. If you think about the number of devices that is for everyone in the world, it's just growing astronomically. Um, we were at a conference earlier this year, um, in fact, in, in November, where we saw some presentations by a company that have um, essentially flooring tiles that generate electricity when you stand on them. But they don't just generate electricity, and they've actually, there are criticisms, they don't really generate enough electricity when you stand on them to make it worth, worthwhile. But what they do is they also sense where you are and where you're moving. So we're even talking about floor tiles that need to be connected to the internet. So this poses all kinds of challenges. But increasingly, more and more things are being connected to the internet. So it's just completely ubiquitous, it's so easy to use, and the availability of services like the cloud are making it even easier, ever easier, for people to produce lots of data. So there's a, there's a massive data challenge that goes with this. So what types of things are there apart from floor tiles? I don't know if you've heard of Amazon Dash, it's not available in the UK. It launched on March 31st in the US, so everybody thought it was an April Fool's joke. Genuinely, everybody thought this was an April Fool's joke. So what it is, it's a little tag that you can hang in places where you use stuff in your house, and when you run out of that thing, you press the button and it orders. So I've run out of electric toothbrush heads, and you press it, and 14 minutes later, an electric toothbrush head turns up. So you don't have to wait to clean your teeth anymore. Um, already been hacked. There's um, a story of a very proud dad in the US who's hacked one of these. Um, he's, he's reasonably technical, not amazingly so. It's not, not outside the bound, bounds of possibility. He has taken one of these, and every time his baby goes to the toilet, he presses the button so he can track the data of his child's bowel movements. So people are already hacking these things in really, really cheap ways to connect to the internet. 
Um, we spoke about Nest a lot last year. Nest announced their Works with Nest program. There's already 15 different products that are connecting to Nest. Um, so with, with Nest, um, and this kind of whole works with Nest thing, it's building an, a, a house where you can connect to all sorts of different things, whether it's, it could be door locks, it could be cameras, all sorts of things are starting to interact with each other. One of the most interesting ways that, that you can interact, and what's, so, so we'll watch this in a sec. If you think, so now when I get home, and again, this, all of this stuff, I used to try and do this where it was really difficult, but, but if I go home, when I walk in the house, I can press a button and, and my lights can turn on with a certain mood. Or they can even pick up that my phone is back within Wi-Fi range and it can turn the lights on, it can turn the heating up, it can start playing the, the Sonos. So it, it's not very difficult to do that. But at the moment, I still have to press a button. I don't, I don't have to, but I, I want to press a button. Amazon Echo, which is only available in the US yet, there isn't a UK release date, but Amazon Echo was the best-selling uh, the best-selling item on Amazon on Black Friday, over $100. So this is all over uh, the US at the moment. I think it's got something like 20, 27,000 re reviews on Amazon. So I'm not, I'm not going to labor what it does. I'm going to show you a really quick video because I think it does it better. So this is Amazon Echo, which you refer to, when you talk to it, you talk to it as Alexa. Can you just run that one? I need to turn the sound up a bit for The time in Helsinki is 4.31 p.m. Alexa, what time is it here? It's 8.31. It's all right, but we'll go forward a, a little bit. Open bay doors. I was born in 1960. How old am I? Somebody born in 1960 would be between 54 years and 4 months and 55 years and 3 months old today. What is the average penis size? <laughs> Penis, average length, six inches. Alexa, what does the fox say? Wah wah we do. Okay, I think that's enough of Alexa. <laughs> you, the chicken or the egg? So you, you kind of get what the deal with Alexa is. I will, as soon as as soon as this goes on sale in the UK, I will be able to say Alexa, turn the lights on, and by voice I can command what my house is doing. Um, so this year, Cyber Barbie was hacked by bullies. So we've got, we're running up on time. So um, Mattel released this uh, Hello Barbie doll, which is Wi-Fi connected and has a microphone in it. Um, unfortunately, it was almost immediately hacked. And um, I'm conscious we've got another group out here. Um, it was almost a... Thank you. Um, so it's almost, almost immediately hacked. Um, and considered one of the greatest threats to, to ch children's security in the world. Because essentially these are turning up in children's bedrooms, people can get access to them, they can actually divert the servers that they're talking to, and they work a bit like Alexa, in that you can ask it questions and it can talk back to you. So this is essentially considered now national security, because even the government, according to the Daily Mirror today, even the government can tap into your Hello Barbie dolls. Um, Lots and lots of, of security breaches this year. I won't talk too much about them because obviously we've got a, a, a group waiting for us. Talk Talk lost 150,000 um, user details, so that included credit cards. Weatherspoons lost 600,000 details, and Ashley Madison lost 32 million. Um, Ashley Madison, I don't feel too sorry about because they've got one of the most grotesque slogans I've ever come across: "Life is short, have an affair." Um, should shouldn't be the slogan of any company ever. Um, but apparently, not only did the, the hackers take offense at what they were doing morally, but also the fact that it, it, they charged $19 to change your details on the site. So, uh, so I'm not sure exactly who was uh, the most keen on that. Um, <laughs> last year, I showed, you, uh, I showed you this slide, which is Target. We'll look at that in a second. This is, this is the uh, share price of TalkTalk. Talk after the, the hack news broke in the UK. And you can see that there is a significant cost to the business. But what's really interesting is if you look at, the, if you look at Target, this is where the hack news broke last year. Uh, this is where the CEO resigned. This was the slide I showed you last year. So by the time I was speaking to you last year, the share price was going back up. But actually, if you look now back to, this is where we were, this is where I spoke to you last year, the share price continued to go up. So you have to start asking yourself, what is the real cost to businesses of not having good enough security? In Ashley Madison's case, the cost was three suicides, many relationships broken up, and an ongoing chain of extortion. So it's really, really difficult to, 
to think about what the internet is doing for us and the cost of weak security in businesses. Uh, in the UK, there, uh, according to Symantec, there's uh, five out of every six businesses has a cyber attack against it. Three out of every four small businesses has a cyber attack against it. Um, George Osborne has said that he intends, uh, he intends to uh, create a new offensive um, cyber capability within the UK. Um, at around the same time that it was actually announced that the US is starting to lag behind Russia in terms of offensive cyber capabilities. Um, and help comes from very odd fronts, Anonymous announced that they are going to go after ISIS. So after the Paris attacks, actually after Charlie Hebdo and the Paris attacks, um, I, uh, Anonymous have actually an, uh, have declared war on the Islamic State. So I am conscious that... that I'm conscious that... that they, okay. So now the important bit, the bit I know that you've been waiting for, is cat science, uh, the most important part of the, the entire year. Um, so I will explain... I will explain what, what you guys need to do is try and watch our cat videos. Oh, it's, it's all right, Phil. Sometimes the cat videos don't work. Cat videos. Okay, I think we've, we've had enough cat videos now. Right, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, so, with, with the cat videos, a researcher, and I think this was at uh, um, the University of Indiana in Bloomington, I think, um, actually did research into what humans get out of watching cat videos. Um, and they found that the people who watch cat videos, there, there is a difference in the personality types and judging from the ooze in the audience, difference in personality types of people that enjoy watching cat videos, um, but also that people that do watch cat videos are less stressed. They feel more positive, they're less prone to negative emotion, um, and that they watch them both at home and at work. Um, <laughs> when, I gave James, James Reed a run through of this earlier and he commented the reason they're less stressed is probably because they're not doing any work <laughs> rather than the, the fact they're not watching any cat videos. Um, now, more important cat science is we now understand, and we, we'll, we'll run another quick video, well, we now understand why cats um, enjoy boxes so much. So I'll let this run in the background while I explain, explain why. So you may have seen Maru before. Maru is, um, is a cat, Japanese cat, who loves boxes. Um, apparently, this is very important science. Don't let me distract you from the video. This is very important science. Um, they have discovered it was... <laughs> At the University of Utrecht, they ran a study with cats in shelters. In one, sh in one group, I don't know why I'm doing this with the cats. In one of the, the groups of cats, they took away all the boxes. In another, they made sure that they were well stacked with boxes. And they found that the stress levels of the cats in the group without the boxes was significantly higher than the group with boxes. <laughs> so Maru is actually self-pacifying herself or himself at the moment. So, so good old Maru, um, that is actually reducing the stress that the cat feels. The other, <laughs> the other thing, the other thing about cats and boxes, and you probably didn't know this, but but cats are comfortable at a temperature ten degrees higher than the average human, which is why you probably see them lying out on really hot things on hot days. They they like the the surrounding environment to be to be ten degrees warmer. Um, Corrugated cardboard is a really good insulator. So, um, so the reason they get in boxes because they're less stressed and because they're warmer. So there you go. I have now helped you understand one of the most important conundrums known to man. So we're almost at the end now. 2016 predictions. I, it would be remiss of me not to give you some things which are going to be proved completely wrong next year. Um, so things which are obviously going to happen. There is no question that these things are going to happen. There will be more high-profile security breaches. There is absolutely no question about it. The Internet of Things will become more thingy. I will probably be saying there is 100 billion devices connected next year. The first commercial drone deliveries will almost certainly start next year. Um, and for the geeks amongst us, I think Amazon Lambda will be this next year's Docker. So Docker was all the rage in tech circles this year, and I think Lambda will be the, all the rage next year. Um, 
So the stupid things. This is where I'm likely to get stuff wrong. Uh, there will be the first lawsuit uh, that is, is brought by somebody who is cra who's in a crash with an autonomous car, where the autonomous car crashes. I can guarantee if that happens, the human will have been doing something stupid when they do it, but they will still file a lawsuit. Um, I think an autonomous car will set a sub eight minute Nürburgring lap. So for those who don't care about Nürbur Nürburgring laps, you can ignore that. Eight minutes is quite fast. I think a car will drive around it uh, on its own uh, and do it in under eight minutes. I think uh, I did actually take a slide out of here about uh, the, the world's first bionic penis. So you may remember I teased this. Um, I decided it wasn't high tech enough because it was actually a pump. So he, he had had his penis reconstructed and he had to pump it. I think next year Elon's going to think about using his, his, um, his electronic snake technology to prosthetic limbs, um, completely unrelated. Uh, and the last thing is the world's first commercial delivery drone is going to get shot down somewhere by an American. <laughs> There's almost no question about it. So I just have one, one thing very, very quickly to leave you with. Um, this is Bloodhound SSC, supersonic car. So this is run by the same team that run, uh, ran Thrust, SSC, and Thrust. So uh, Britain has actually a pretty good reputation of running world land speed records. And I was really, really privileged to hear this guy, Richard Noble, speak this week about the Bloodhound project. And what was really interesting is Richard was very, very down on the state of STEM education, so science, technology, engineering, and medicine education in the UK. And that actually, as, as a country, we need to be exporting much more and we need to be manufacturing much more. But actually, the rate of, of kids going into science uh, disciplines is absolutely woeful in the UK. And even worse than that is the number of girls going into STEM education in the UK. And we need to redress that. So he was talking about this amazing car. This car is going to travel at over 1,000 miles an hour. It's Mach 1.4. So it's going to, be, going to be going faster than most, well, certainly all commercial airliners, significantly faster than commercial air, airliners at ground level. So this is an incredible piece of engineering. When explaining it earlier this week, I had to explain, well, all it's doing is going from standing to very fast and then stopping again. It's not really going anywhere. It's not going to help the world. But what it is, it's, it's a, a flagship engineering project for the UK. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really important thing for kids to get excited about. And so I spoke to, to Richard Noble, and I, I emailed him the other day, and I said that I was doing this, and I asked him to write some words for you. So, so he sent a message um, about, about Bloodhound that I shall read to you. So Richard says, this is him in his voice, he's, he's much more plummy than I am, but it's taken 160 man years and the work of 340 companies to build the Bloodhound SSC land speed record car. It's designed for 1,050 miles per hour, that's Mach 1.4. We run the car in 2016 to 800 miles an hour and again in 2017 to 1,000 miles an hour. While you might think the car is all about going fast, the primary objective is to create a new generation of scientists and engineers worldwide. We have 6,000 schools in the UK on the programme, 1,000 in South Africa, and since the project is being followed in 238 countries, we expect there are many more schools using Bloodhound education. I think he wrote this bit for the data scientists in the group. I've left the best bit to last. Every time the car runs in 2016 and 2017, we're going to export 500 data channels of car run information to the web with big data manipulation apps. The whole point of this project is to inspire kids, generally, to inspire us all, but to inspire kids mainly. So if you have enjoyed the stuff we've talked about today, it's all science and technology. If you've enjoyed it because it's fun, because science and technology is amazing, then the thing that you can do today is to take that out of the room. And if you've got kids or if you know kids, inspire them to do something with science. So somehow, Get them to do an amazing science experiment. Get them to do a course at school, which is, which is inspiring. If you don't have kids, go and do your own scientific education. Uh, and if you can't think of anything to do with science, then go and look up the Blood, Bloodhound Project. And if you can't think of Christmas presents, you can get people's names put on the tail for 15 quid. So, um, so go, go to the site, have a look at it. It's an absolutely incredible project and something we should all be supporting. So that's it for this year. Um, I'll, I'll start running this video. This, this is one of the most ridiculous houses, um, Christmas lights you have ever seen. So I'll put this on as, as, we, all, uh, as we all walk out of here. But hopefully you've had a fantastic time. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it. If you want any more information, we'll be sharing this deck with all of the links in it. Go and look up anything that's interesting and start saving your links for next year so we can do this all over again. Thank you all very much.
you don't have to stay for this.